Good afternoon, everyone. I hope everybody's okay, good, and I'm happy to see you all here today. <clears throat> As you saw on our uh, the, the screen that I was sharing, we're going to start our meeting today talking about time is of the essence. The reason is because uh, lately we had a few agents that had a problem and had to face the problem because they did not look into the time on the contract. And that happens uh, very quite often, you know? And that's why I wanted to bring that to your attention. And there's old agents, you know, people that have been in business for a while, that are making that simple mistake. And also for new people, it's, it's, it will be good also. Guys, there's a few things that we need to remember when we talk about time is of the essence is because um, there are dates on a contract that you need to follow. I know it's a, it's a very grateful when you find a buyer and you finally find a property that the buyer likes and you write a contract, but your job doesn't end there. You cannot sit down and wait for the closing uh, to get your commission. There are some tasks that you need to follow, you know, some, some tasks that you need to do in order to make sure that it will close and everybody will be happy and you're gonna get your commission. Remember that I always say that the reason why a buyer or seller hire us, it's not because they think we need money, it's because they need our professional service. And when we represent a buyer, our number one job is to protect the buyer's interest especially his deposit. And that's all related to date. So let's look into a few dates and I will share some, um, some uh, stories with you, okay? Now we have a few dates on a contract that you need to look at. The first is the first deposit. Sometimes when we write a contract, we put on a contract that uh, the first deposit will be done three days after the acceptance. So you need to look into that dates because if you don't collect a deposit um, on time, you know, with these three dates, you can be charged with uh, negligent and failure to account. That's two charges, okay? If you put on a contract that there will be a second deposit that will be done after the inspection, you have to also be looking into that date. Because again, if you fail to collect the second deposit, it is gonna be your fault. And anything that goes wrong with the dates, it always goes to you. It's never buyer's fault, it's always the agent fault. And if the buyer loses the deposit, the buyer can't sue the agent for that. And you don't want that type of problem, right? And it's something very simple to avoid and be happy all the way until the day you get your commission. Uh, again, the, the other date is the inspection period. If you put 10 days to inspection period, especially on an as is contract, there is a clause on the as is contract that says something like this. If the buyer at buyer's sole discretion decides that the property is not uh, suitable, for the buyer, the buyer has the right to cancel the contract in writing and will get his deposit back. So that's a window that we have thanks to AZ's contract because that window we don't have on the standard contract. We only have that window on the AZ's contract. That's a window that we give to the buyer the opportunity to get out of the contract if he doesn't like the results of the inspection. There are some situations where the inspection, if it's not so good, the buyer can still renegotiate with the seller part of the expenses for the repairs. But if the report comes too bad, the buyer may not want to proceed and the buyer wants to cancel. So if we don't look into the date for the inspection period and we don't ascend the cancellation of the contract, within the inspection period, then their window will close. 
the buyer won't be able to cancel anymore. So I had a situation when I sent the contract to a seller for 10 days inspection and the, the agent came back with the seven days. So we don't want to give you 10 days. I want to give you seven days. So before I pass this information to the buyer to see if the buyer will accept or not, remember that it's still my responsibility if the seven days come and we are not ready. Uh, so I called my inspection, my inspector. I worked with this guy for many times, for many years. And I asked him, uh, Juan, I need you to do an inspection. Today's Saturday, and I need you to do an inspection uh, as soon as possible. When can you do the inspection? He told me, I can do it on Monday. And when can I have the report? I will give you a Monday afternoon. So Monday basically will be my first day. So I know that if he sent me on, on Monday afternoon, uh, I will be able to send it to the buyer on Monday afternoon. He will have Tuesday and Wednesday to look into the report and make a decision. So before I accept seven days, I made sure that my inspector will have schedule free to do the inspection and send me the report with time for the buyer to read the report and make his decision either to proceed or to cancel. And luckily, the buyer canceled because there were so many things wrong with the property that the buyer decided not to renegotiate with the seller prices or anything, and then the buyer exercised his right to cancel. Uh, one question, guys. Can you hear me? I want to make sure that you guys can hear me. Yes. Good. Yes. Great. Yes. Sometimes I think I'm, I'm talking to myself here. I don't see any cameras here on, and uh, it's, it's, it's No, off. we're here. <laughs> good. Good. So, Another date, very important, if you are uh, representing a buyer that is um, for, uh, applying for a loan, we have to get the loan commitment in general. If you don't put any dates on the contract, the standard is 30 days. So you have 30 days to present your loan commitment. Now, Let's, um, let's go back a little bit and say, when you write a contract and if it's uh, contingent to finance, we always get like 45 days, on or before 45 days after the acceptance. So the lender will have time to prepare all the documentations, to process all the run the writing process and get our loan approval. But if we put 30 days, the lender will have to be ready to give us a long commitment within these 30 days. If the lender is not ready, you need to get an extension for the long commitment. Okay? Because if for some reasons it doesn't close, you already fell on one date. Every single date that we have in the contract is important. Again, the first slide says time is of the essence. Uh, appraisal. Also, appraisal, uh, you should follow up with the lender because now you guys know that before the buyer was able to hire the appraiser. Now the bank does it. So you need to keep following up with the loan originator to find out if the loan originator already ordered the appraisal because we need to have the appraisal done because if the price is not right, meaning what, what I mean by price is not right. If your purchase price is above the appraisal's price, and remember the appraisal price is the market value. If the appraisal price is below the sales price, lender was, will go into land based on the appraisal's value. So you're going to have to renegotiate with the seller uh, about this difference. You know, sometimes we can meet in the middle. Sometimes the seller will reduce all the difference. Sometimes they don't have a negotiation and then we have to cancel the contract, which is very normal. But all this thing is normal. If you look into the time, if you, if you let the time pass by, you lose the opportunity to save your buyer and to save yourself from a problem. Now, the last one, which is the most important, is the closing date. 
If you put ONO before 45 days, you're gonna count the calendar days 45. And let's say the 45 days is uh, October 20th, okay, September 20th. Now we're getting close to September 20th and you don't have a long commitment. You have to be prepared at least five days prior to the closing days to get a extension for your contract. Because if you don't get the extension prior to five days, if you don't submit the extension prior to five days, the selling agent might have a trouble to communicate with the seller. Let's say seller, it's on vacation and it's a hard place to get in contact with the seller or the seller has no access to computers. So if you try to do that one day, two days prior to closing, it might not be enough time to get the uh, extension. And if you pass the closing date, you don't close, and it's the buyer's fault, the buyer will lose his deposit. If the seller does not agree to give an extension after the closing date. So uh, we had a, like, I think since I'm, uh, I became a broker for this company, we have about five situations like that that on the day of the closing, we don't have a commitment letter, we don't have a denial letter, and it's already six o'clock, and we're trying to get a extension. And the seller says, I'm not gonna give an extension, and the buyer has a five, $10,000 deposit. There was one case that the buyer had $15,000 deposit, and the seller said, I'm not gonna give the money back. And the seller has the rights to keep. Meaning, do you believe that the buyer will lose his deposit quietly? I don't think so. It's fifteen thousand dollars. And what what I I was teaching my class yesterday for the sixty three hours hours, and I told them, look, for some people, ten thousand, fifteen thousand dollars is nothing. For some other people, ten thousand, fifteen thousand dollars is everything that they have, all the money that they were able to save during their life. So you, it's your responsibility. They are trusting you with that $15,000 to put the deposit. And you don't want them to lose that money. Not first, because our job is to service the public professionally. We don't want to cause any harm, right? Two, we want to make money without any problem, any trouble, anything. Because if the buyer loses the deposit, the buyer is going to sue you. And there's a chance that the buyer will win in court and you're going to have to give that money back to the buyer. And you don't want to lose $15,000 and you don't want to lose your sleep because in between, you know, by the time that you got the news that the buyer is going to sue you to the moment that the court made a decision, you're not going to be sleeping well. We don't need those things in our lives, right? Life is already, you know, complicated, hard sometimes. We need to make some decisions. We need to work hard. We need to contact a lot of people. We have bills to pay. We already have enough problems and we don't need those. So look into all those dates, especially the closing date. Don't wait for the last moment to request an extension. And this is what I do. If it's a financing and uh, we need an extension, I request the lender a uh, denial letter for the loan. I request them a denial letter. And I submit the extension with the denial letter and with the release and cancellation form. Why do I do that? Because I'm already telling the seller, if he doesn't give him the extension, I'm canceling the contract. So he doesn't have a chance to fight back. I'm not gonna give you, um, the extension. And sometimes it's the selling agent who is giving you a hard time. I had this situation many times and I still don't understand. We don't have a power of attorney from the seller. So we do not have the rights to make any decision for the seller. Every request that comes from the buyer's agent to the selling agent has to be given to the seller. And the seller is the one who's going to make a decision. But if he, send it to the seller, the email that I sent with the extension, the denial letter and release and cancellation, he's gonna know, well, why am I gonna say I'm not gonna give you the extension? He's already giving him the release and cancellation. Mine as well, I give them 10 days more 
and instead of uh, accept the cancellation, because if we have the denial letter from the lender, there is no other way. The money will be released to the buyer. Now, there's a few things that I want you guys to remember. When a broker or a title company holds the money in escrow, he's holding the money in trust. That money doesn't belong to the buyer. Now the money belongs to the buyer and the seller, and especially does not belong to the buyer, to, to the broker. Broker has no power to decide who is he going to give the money to when there is a dispute over the escrow money. That's why when we representing the buyer, we prepare the purchase and sales contract. We put contingencies on the contract. Why do we put contingencies on the contract? To protect the buyer. And when I protect the buyer, I'm also protecting myself from those uh, uh, situations, right? So when I put in the contract that this contract is contingent upon buyer being approved on a contract, on a, on a loan, if the buyer is not approved on the loan, the contingency in the contract signed by the seller guarantees that even if he doesn't sign the release and cancellation, whoever is holding the, the escrow money can release the money to the buyer because it's in the contract. Again, if the buyer decides within the inspection period to cancel the contract, the buyer, and even if the, the seller does not sign the release and cancellation, whoever is holding the money, broker or title company, have the right to release the money, disburse the money to the buyer. Now, when we have a situation that it's not in a contract and we have a dispute over an escrow money, then the broker needs to communicate to FRAC. And the broker has 15 days to give FRAC a written notification about this dispute. And when do we have a situation like that? When we let the time goes by and we don't do anything about it. The, the, the contract was supposed to close it today and the land is not ready. And the seller does not want to give the, the extension. And when it comes tomorrow, the contract is expired, right? Because the due date was today. Tomorrow the contract is expired. And if it doesn't close, then Whose fault is this? Oh, the buyer's fault. Why? Because the buyer did not provide the loan and the buyer did not provide a denial letter. And the buyer also did not provide an extension. When I say buyer, I say you. You did not provide the, the denial letter. You did not provide the release and cancellation. You did not provide the extension. Now the seller has all the right to keep the money and the buyer will lose the money and they go after you. Guys, is this clear? Yes. Yes, it is. Yes. Good. You see, it's not complicated, you know? It's just a responsibility like any other job. Any job that we have, we will have responsibilities. And this is one of responsibility that is part of our job. We need to look into those dates. We cannot sign a contract and sit down and relax waiting for the closing date so we can celebrate the money. We need to follow those dates in order to protect the buyer and protect ourselves. Now, let's look into some of the, the forms that we need to have. This is the extension. This form is on the uh, form simplicity, okay? So you can see here, let me move my screen with, this, with uh, you guys here. Now, between that, this is extension addendum to the contract. So we're asking an extension, okay? Between the seller, the buyer. The reason is we can extend the closing date. Seller and buyer agree to extend the closing date until then you put 10 days or the financing period because you did not get the loan commitment and the inspection period. Let's say uh, the inspector took too long to prepare the report, to go to do the inspection, and the buyer also you know, was not in town to look into the inspection reports, and now we need an extension. And the same form, you can use the same form for all three situations, either to extend the closing date, to extend the loan commitment letter, and to extend the inspection period, okay? 
So it's very simple. You just prepare the document, send to the buyer, to the buyer to sign. Once you get the buyer's signature, you send to the, to the seller's agent. The sellers will get the signature from the seller and we're good, okay? Now, if the buyer uh, does not get an uh, extension or we got the loan, the, the denial letter, or the buyer decides not to proceed with the purchase because he didn't like the, the inspection report, this is the, the, the form we're going to send, right? We need to prepare this form, not the buyer. The agent does it. And it's called release and cancellation of contract for sale and purchase. So you're going to fill this uh, uh, form here. And then at the bottom, you're going to put it. It's, it doesn't show here. But at the bottom, you're going you're gonna to put it who the money is going to be released to. So the money is going to be released to the buyer. And then buyer will sign. You get it signed. You send it to the seller's agent, and the seller's agent will get the signature from the seller. Now, again, I had a situation uh, on the same example I gave you guys that the buyer decided not to proceed with the purchase, and the seller's agent did not want to uh, send the release and cancellation to the seller and get the signature. I was, I've been calling them all the time. But we don't need it because I have a proof on the email that I send the release and cancellation within the inspection period. So that's a proof that I need that the cancellation was submitted to the seller uh, within the inspection period. Even if the seller doesn't sign, the broker or the title company who is holding the money will be able to release the money to the buyer. And if you did a good job with the buyer, they don't even need to release the money. They can keep the money there and use it for your next uh, property that you're going to find for your buyer. Okay? There is no need to, to get them signed if you are doing everything according to the date. Okay, now, we had a situation where some agents was calling me about what can I get from a buyer? I'm working with the buyer and uh, what can I get from a buyer to guarantee that I'm that he's gonna be working with me. In general, we don't need to get anything when we work to a buyer. But of course, this is a very competitive market, and I have a news for you that you don't know. And I'm sorry to say that, but buyers are liars. Don't tell anybody, okay? They tell you that they are working only with you, and they might be working with the two, three other agents. And there might be a chance that you're going to be working. You're not going to be compensated for the job that you are performing. But this uh, agreement, it's hard to get the buyer to sign. Why is it hard to get the buyer to sign? Because you are having an exclusive, <coughs> excuse me, you're getting an exclusive buyer's broker agreement, which means that during the agreement period, the buyer will have to purchase a property with you. Right? If he doesn't like the service that you're providing or something else, uh, then the buyer would like to not continue work with you and he can't because he has an agreement with you. Okay? So, but if you can't get the buyer to sign, this is the form, exclusive buyer brokerage agreement. And then you put like six months period that you're gonna be work with the buyer, you're gonna commit yourself, to the buyer to help him find exactly what he's looking for and you're gonna fight for the best price possible. And you're gonna protect his interest by following up with the dates, with the contract, title company, inspection, um, lenders, and you're gonna do your job. And if the buyer's agree, then he can sign that and you are protected. You know that the buyer is not gonna go anywhere. But there is another way that you can, you can also protect yourself. If the buyer does not want to sign this and you got a, like a, um, uh, a cold call from a buyer and he wants to see a property, sometimes, you know, I know it's not fair, but there are people out there that they have, like say, a relative who is a realtor, but they're not, they're not doing what you guys are doing. 
they did not burn the boats to dedicate to view state. You guys are dedicating to view state. You don't have a, another job. Real estate is not your part-time job, it's your full-time job. But there are people out there that they have relatives, that they have their full-time jobs that's not related to real estate, but they do have a license. And they tell them, look, call anyone, ask them to show you the property. When you find something you like, you let me know and I write the contract. This is unfair from the buyer, from this agent who is instructing the buyer to do this. And for you guys to avoid this situation, and I had this scenario more than one time, I got the feeling when I was talking to the buyer on the phone that he just wanted to see the property. He doesn't want my help to do the contract or anything. I got that feeling. He was pushing to see the property. No, I want to see the property. Can I see the property today? I want to see the property. Hmm. I said, okay. I, how about 3 o'clock? Is that okay for you? I can show you the property today at 3 o'clock. Oh, okay, it's fine with me. Okay, so this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to have a showing agreement between me and you. Oh, what is that showing agreement? Well, it's simple. I'm going to show you this specifically property. And if you like this property, you're going to work with me to purchase the property. So I'm going to write the contract for you. If they say, no, I don't want to sign the contract, then I'm not going to show the property. And some people will say, oh, but then you're going to lose a buyer. I can't lose what I don't have. I only lose what I have. And this buy is clearly not mine. So I'm not losing a buy. I'm gaining my time, not wasting getting out of my office to go show a property when I know that the buyer has no intention to write a contract with me. Why wouldn't he sign this showing agreement? Look, isn't that fair that if I get out of my office, go to this particular property, open the door and show the property for you. And if you like the property, don't you think it's fair that I write the contract? Oh yes, I think it's right. So there's no problem for you to sign the agreement. And if they say, yes, I'll sign the agreement, then I will prepare this agreement. And again, this agreement is only for that particular property. It's not a buyer's, uh, exclusive buyer's agreement. It's just for that property. So, and I can put uh, the time and how long if, he decides to buy the property and he calls his brother to do the contract, I can go after the buyer and get my commission, okay? This is another way to protect yourself. The best, the, 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 not, not the best, I don't say the best, but what I do is to create a good relationship with the buyer. When I know that the buyer is not gonna go behind my back using another agent. I had a situation, I was showing a property for a couple right here in Sanyais, and I showed him about four properties that day, four or five properties. Um, and at the end of the day, we were having a conversation and I, and I told them that, you know, I don't mind that the seller shows the property. And, and the, the buyer told me, look, three agents was trying to give me their business card. You see, it's very nasty. Because the, the, the seller's agent, they already guarantee his 3%. No matter who sells the property, who brings the buyer, he will get his 3%. Now he's going after my 3% to steal my 3%. I have no respect for people like that. But they exist. They're out there doing the same thing. But because I did a good job with this couple, I was you know, sitting down with them, giving all the explanation, answering all the questions, and I was very available for them for timing to show the property, for questions that they have. He, they, this guy refused to get the, 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 the business card. He told them, I have Orlindo working with me, and if I have any questions, I'll call him, and he will contact you. So the best way, really, is to uh, create a good relationship with the buyer and make sure that the buyer is not going to go behind your back, okay? <clears throat> now, this is an addendum that I like to, to show you. It's, it's, it's a very hard to work with, but it's possible. I have experience that I you have- know, I have a question about this, um, yeah. the showing agreement. Okay. Um, uh, if I prove that I showed the property after 
like after I showed him and I don't I did I didn't have the showing agreement and if I prove that I that I ha that I show the property isn't it like an ethics um, thing for the association or something that I we can we can do this they can uh, they can uh, write the contract if somebody else show the okay the, the property. let me tell you one thing I had some some uh, experience in the past and one of the things that's very hard to prove is the procuring cards. They do have even the terminology, beautiful name, procuring cards. So I am the procuring cards, here's the email. But if you didn't write the contract, it's hard to prove in court. Okay? So it's, it's going to be a court decision. I cannot tell you that if this thing happened, you're gonna win or lose. I had a conversation, I don't know if you guys know, we have a hotline for attorneys, they are in Orlando. And they're free for us because we pay our annual fee to our association and we can use them. It's a 407 number. If you don't have it, let me know. I have the number and I, I share with you in our chat. And you can call them anytime, anytime, business hours, of course. Just do go ahead and share it in the chat. Okay, I will do that. Uh, as soon as I finish, okay? Because I'm going to have to look into my phone and get the number and then I share with you, but I will promise you that I put another chat. Thank you. I'll, I'll do it. Uh, Arlinda? Yes. Uh, the question regarding the same. What, what if we did, um, let's say, the showing assist? Do you have to do the, you know, the paperwork then? If you just schedule a showing um, through MLS? Does it yes. count? Okay. This is the thing. You can show that you request a showing. Mm -hmm. But how can you prove that you showed up for the showing or the buyer showed up for the showing? Mm -hmm. You know, okay. we, we have to understand that when we go to court, we have to prove without doubting our case. Mm -hmm. Okay. And yeah, when, when we don't have anything to prove, it becomes hard to a judge make a decision in our favor. Well, text messages, yes, I'm here, 15 minutes away, la, la, la. Thank Good. you for showing. That's, that's one proof. But again, okay. it's going to be a court decision. Yeah, I've seen yeah, cases mm -hmm. that I spoke with the, uh, uh, with the attorneys in Orlando, and they mm -hmm. told me that I don't want to share this, but I'm going to share you what I heard, okay? It's not a final uh, information, but that's what they told me. If you have a contract, signed by the buyer, you have a proving that you are the procuring cause. If you don't have a contract, you can't prove you, you have a procuring cause. Mm -hmm. What we do, you know? Right, can I ask one more question? Uh, I'm sorry? Can we ask another question or of we should course, do it yes, then? So let's say for example, I go to show a unit and I sign this showing agreement uh, with the buyer but at the end, I find out, well, I mean, at the end, he probably goes with somebody else. How, where do I go to find if that unit was sold to my client through somebody else? You, you go to I the association it? first, yes. And then you start the claim. Like there is no association. another way? Huh? There no. is no simple Going way that I can just go and pick a... It's, it's more complicated because this is a... Um, uh, let's say it's a broken off the, what is it called? Um, I can't remember right now. But it has to go through uh, administrative law first before go to court. First it needs to go to administrative law. Okay? Yeah, uh, in any because situation, in my case, for, huh? In my case, I showed for like 30 units on Friday and Saturday, right? Let's say 30. Okay. And if I sign 30 of this showing agreements or like, I don't know, I think for each unit has to be one showing agreement signed, right? That the client is you can going to list, stay with me. I put it back here on the, on the screen. Oh, okay. You can list all okay, the properties and, there. All the 30 properties. And let's say, for example, something happens and I don't know how he goes and after he saw the unit with me, he goes again to other deals or maybe it's his family friends. I don't know which units from 30, but I want to know if those 30 units were sold, one of them to my client. That's my question. Like, how can I find out? Oh, after they, after they recorded in public records, you're going to have to wait like two, three months to find out. 
and then I can send them a list and say, please let me know if one of these properties was sold to this and so and so person. No, you you will see on the on the uh, public records the name of the buyer. Oh, I can go and okay, in the public records I can go and find it. Okay, yeah, of course. It. Yeah, you don't need to call anybody. Once you find out what happened, then you go for it. Let me share with you an uh, uh, And then uh, I can go on MLS and I can see who is the realtor who sold it to. Yes, yes, of course. Because it shows an MLS on the bottom. It shows, okay, yes. You it. go to the property, you go to the, the, the MLS number, you always keep the MLS Pro number. Property research public record. Yes, you, and you search on the MLS for closed sales. And then you're going to mm -hmm. see who was the agent representing the buyer. Okay, and then after public records, uh, being updated with the new deed, then you find out who the buyer was. Okay. Uh, and then you can start the process. Okay, yeah. got it. Thank you. The and then I'll have a few questions in regards of the previous uh, topic that you spoke, but I guess I'll ask it at the end. Which one? Uh, about the, when you sign the contract and you have to go through the first, second deposit uh, inspection and stuff like that. All right, go ahead. Ask After you're done with everything. Okay, so first question is when we say, for example, that we need extensions and stuff like that, and we all know that we work in Florida with a lot of realtors that they're very with the attitude yes. and not professional. And I've had so many yes. of them. And like, I know they take decisions on behalf of the owners without even like delivering the information to them. I can feel it because I, I feel the attitude and the way how they communicate and how they act and the interest. So do I, um, do we have the permission as a buyer's agent, for example, to say, I need your answer to my extension to be initialed by the seller that he denies, or I need the email and everything, I need everything to be proved. Like, don't just tell me, no, he doesn't want to do it. Can yes. we insist on having everything you, you, initialed? You can, have them, you can ask them to send any uh, information from the seller, but maybe mm -hmm. they will not. You know, it's not something that has, that you can um force them but on the other hand if you submit the 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 extension and the buyer doesn't sign there is no way for 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 the buyer to start to sign it i don't want to sign it you know it's 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 difficult you know the best way is to try to get a good relationship or send the denial letter that's how how i do it i always send the denial letter with the extension because if they don't give them the extension, they already have the release and cancellation. I don't like to uh, have a discussion, argument with anybody. I don't like it. I don't like this type of thing, convincing people about something. The guy's yelling on the other side, and I'm very easy to yell as well. Everybody says, oh, Linda, you're a very patient guy, but my fuse is this big. So, okay. If I hear something bad, then Amala is gonna react bad also. So then I avoid this type of situation. So well, the best way for me to avoid this discussion, I'll send the release and cancellation. Guy, you don't want to give him the extension. This is the release and cancellation. You okay. Know? Yeah, because you know, even if you try to be nice to the authors at the beginning, that's their approach. Like. You always try to be the nicer, but if they're, they're not nice people, you can't do it. Second question is what happens if after closing a purchase, like for example, the inspector did his inspection, he sent the report, we close the deal a month after the, own, the, the buyer lives in the unit and he finds out that there is something wrong, which could have been found by the inspector and it was not found or reported. What is happening in that case? Because well, my buyer he, yesterday asked me that question about uh, how it works in Florida because he's from New York. Yes, I've seen a situation like that and the sell and the uh, inspector send them the contract and the inspection report that says that uh, it's not a deep inspection, you know, it's a, a yeah. readily visible for them to find something. And there are something that they can't find. Again, it's another case for a court to solve. And, and again, we cannot say what the decision will be done because that's uh, uh, according to the judge, okay? But I have a situation. When I bought my house here the first time in, in, um, in Eastern Shores, long time ago, uh, the inspector came and he did the inspection on the, on the air condition. And it was working. And he measured the temperature that was working. When I moved into the property, um, four hours, after the AC was on, 
it stopped blowing cold air. It just started blowing like hot air or normal. <clears throat> so I got in contact with the inspection and it's hard because he did the inspection. He cannot stay in the house for four hours to find out that after four hours, the AC is not working. So it became my responsibility and I had to uh, replace the AC unit. You know, there, there are some situations that is hard. What you have to do is that get an, um, <clears throat> an inspection um, disclosure and also a walkthrough disclosure to release yourself from any responsibility. That's the important thing. Let the inspector deal with the problem. If the problem arises, let the inspector deal as long as you are off the hook. I'm gonna show you the, uh, the, uh, the uh, addendum that you can have the buyer signed, releasing your brokerage and all the agent, agents under the brokerage from any responsibility that might come after uh, the closing, okay? Yeah, that's what I need because my client is having the inspection tomorrow and he said what happens if after a few months after I move in, this uh, this happens like something in the unit. So that would be a good form that I have to ask the client to sign as well. So Because okay. I'm going on behalf of my buyer to show the unit to the inspector because he's mm -hmm. in New York. So I will be present. And the last question is um, my situation again, what happened yesterday when we finally got the contract active and moving forward to uh, doing the escrow money today, I think today, um, we signed the contract and then 10 minutes after it's effective, the seller's buyer, it's calling me, uh, I mean, he texted me, we have a huge problem. The furniture actually is not included in the sale, which when he showed the unit, it was beautiful. And he said to my buyers, like you can keep the furniture where you can throw away. Obviously, when I made the contract, the offer, I put the note furniture at the time of showing has to stay in the unit if agreed on the purchase price. So after the contract is active, he texts me, he's like, we cannot give you the furniture. We're going to take it out and stuff like that where we cancel the contract. My buyer said, no, I want the furniture. The contract is active. We'll move forward. So the, the seller's buy, uh, agent said, Okay, we'll go ahead and uh, move with the closing. We will lose 20 days. When your buyer comes in the unit, we're going to have it empty because we'll take the furniture. So is there anything I have to do? Because at the end, uh, the realtor called me and said he's going to pay the owner back some two or $3,000 for the furniture, but my buyer still gets it because it's his fault. He didn't review the contract when I sent it to him. It was on Sunday. He was at the beach. Okay. All right. So what do we do in this, in this stations? Because, you know, is it like something that you can go to court and start doing yes, this? Like you can go to court, but this is the thing for future. Okay, Nadia. I had a situation exactly like that. And I believe I have the, the addendum here okay. with me someplace. If I find, I can show you guys. Uh, let me see if I have it here. Give me one second. And I show you what you have to do in the future. Okay. Don't put it in a contract because in the contract doesn't say anything. You put in the contract that all furnitures that was in the unit at the time we showed, that's very vague. What furniture is that? And this is very important, especially when we talk about um, uh, uh, fixtures, you know, chandeliers, uh, ceiling fan. Uh, now we have the, the smart thermostat. All of those things is, far, is, is fixture. And you have to point that out, everything by the name with the picture on the contract, okay? Now, let's uh, say- At this point, okay, let's wait. Because when I saw the unit, it was 30 of them. So we went inside for 20 minutes. We saw all the design, which is an MLS. It matches the unit. I didn't have a chance when I submitted the offer to get the inventory of what was in the unit. Mm -hmm. I only remember what was there because I have a video of the unit and I have the MLS pictures. I did not know until a day after the showings will go for that unit. And up of 30 units, I didn't have the inventory list for 30 units to know which one is gonna sell. Okay, with so what? This, this is what you do, okay? For future references. When you're gonna sign the contract and you know the furniture is gonna be there, you are going to go back to the unit. You're gonna take a picture of every single corner of the unit that has furniture. You're gonna create a PDF file and then you're gonna put it there. All these furnitures, and items are included on the sale and have the seller initial. That's the only proof that you have, okay? Same thing goes to example, 
a refrigerator and a stove and microwave. Let's say you go to a property and they have a sub-zero refrigerator and a wolf uh, stove and microwave. So the buyer is happy. Oh, I'm getting an apartment with a sub-zero refrigerator and a wolf appliance. Amazing. So when the contract says that in the contract is included refrigerator, stove, and microwave, but it doesn't say the brand. So the seller can go back to the unit, remove the sub-zero, and put a GE, remove the, the, the stove, and he's a, a complying with the contract. Now, are we going to have a problem with your buyer? Yes, we're going to have a, pro a problem with your buyer, right? Those things, it's a little details that we forget. It will take away our happiness at the end of the contract because our happiness is get our commission and see that everybody's happy about it. Now buyer is upset because he was buying a property with the sub-zero refrigerator and now he was replaced with the GE, right? Mm -hmm. You got to put it in the contract. And if it's more, I, I had one, this is the one I was going to try to, to, to find to show you guys but I don't remember the guy's name. Uh, he bought a, a, a unit right here on, on Hallandale and uh, the unit was fully furnished, fully furnished, even with plates, silverware, cups, everything. Uh, blender, coffee maker, toaster, everything was in the unit. So, the, the seller said everything is included. We have some beautiful arts, you know, pictures on the wall, beautiful. And he said everything is included. All right, can we trust him? Well, I don't think that in this business, trust goes that far. So I went back to the unit and I took a picture of every corner that had um, furniture or anything hanging on the wall that he said is going to stay, a TV that was going to stay. I took a picture, I made a PDF file, I sent to the seller, the seller signs, now we're covered. At the day of the walkthrough, I took that piece of paper and I went in every corner that I took a picture just to make sure that that piece of furniture is still there. We had a situation in our office that was exactly the same. The, the, the house was selling with all the furniture and the, and the seller said, everything will stay. So when the buyer saw the unit, his wife saw a chest, beautiful chest. And she was already planning in her mind what she was gonna do with the chest. She was gonna clean up, she's gonna paint, she's gonna do a lot of things. And that was the only thing that was missing at the day of the closing. The chest was not there. I think if anything else was missing, she was not gonna be upset. But the chest, she was very upset. So we had to get in contact with the selling agent and luckily the seller was honest enough to bring it back. But if he didn't want to bring it back, he didn't have to because we don't have anything in a contract that says that the chest is included on the sale. We just said that all the furniture is there. So our job is to protect the buyer and protect ourselves. We don't want this type of situation at the day of closing. We had a situation uh, in, with one of our agents a long time ago and they're walking through the guy didn't see the TV on the wall he was under the impression that the TV was going to stay I don't know why because he saw that it was hanging on the wall and he was under the impression that the TV was uh, part of the deal and he was very upset very upset he was screaming now we had the impression that the guy bought a TV that comes with the house not the other way around. So what the agents did to solve the problem, they went to uh, Best Buy, they bought a TV, they shared the, the expenses from their commission and gave to the buyer to solve the problem. Otherwise, it's not going to close. So you see that those things we need to oversee. You know? We have to, to, to see before it happens. It's, 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 it becomes a common sense. It's like when you drive, you know, when, when you get used to that, you're driving, you can drive, you can drink, you can smoke, you can sing, you can clap, you know, it becomes a, a common sense, right? But you, you have to do those things to protect yourself. Guys, we are getting to, to the end and I have uh, Anthony with us. I will continue with all those addendums next Thursday, okay? Nadia, if you need that question about the addendum, 
uh, call me, okay? I'll talk to you. You don't have to wait until next Thursday because you have urgent on knowing these things. So give me a call and I'll talk to you and then I'll show you what okay. the addendum is, okay? Thank you. Da. Good. Anthony, are you here with us? Yeah, I'm here. Hey, thank you, Anthony, again for being here with us. Of course. Um, let me stop my sharing. Let me find you. All right, great. Anthony, I, you have some uh, news for us, right? Yeah, a couple, a couple quick updates. Uh, we had some things happening legally in the past couple weeks. Uh, so as we know, there was that foreclosure and eviction moratorium that expired at the end of September, excuse me, at the end of August, and it was extended now through September, and now it'll expire on October 1st. So the extension has the same limitations as last month, so it's limited to residential tenants uh, and single-family home mortgages. Um, but now that order has been extended through October 1st. Um, additionally, FEMA has just approved an additional $300 weekly benefit for those unemployed. Um, so they've guaranteed at least three weeks of an additional $300. Those payments will start going out on September 11th. And that would be anybody that as of August 1st collected at least $100 in unemployment compensation due to uh, the pandemic. Uh, and last, a little bit of positive news. Uh, I was reading a report yesterday. It's the new Douglas Elliman report for August, uh, and it just came out. And so they reported that Miami-Dade has experienced an increase in sales year over year. Uh, so for home sales, they're up by 18.5%. Condo sales are up by 2.2%. But the one that is most surprising is Broward. Broward is now a hotspot. They have a 135.6% increase in single family ho home new contract signs and 161% increase in newly signed contracts for condos. So Broward is now a new hotspot and it is very indicative of the shift for buyers now. Buyers are now looking for properties that can offer them things such as a home office. They need space for a home gym. Uh, they need space sometimes for children who are now doing virtual school from home. Um, there's emphasis on large kitchens where you could eat in uh, because the restaurants obviously have been limited and not as many people are going out to eat in restaurants. And the properties in Broward are able to offer them that space. So it's, it, it's neatly in that not rural, not too urban categories. It offers the advantageous uh, benefits of a city, but there is properties that have a lot more space um, and is definitely something that it's, it would be good for realtors to look into the Broward market um, and obviously showcasing these amenities that um, buyers are now looking for in listings um, because we're seeing a large, large increase in newly signed contracts. Um, that's about it that I have for you for this week. Um, so I'll turn it back over to you, Arlindo. All right, Anthony, thank you. Thank you again for your participation. And that's a great news. Guys, if you are looking to a place to farm, I believe Broward is a good place to start because the time and effort that you're going to put it in any place, it will be the same time and the same effort. So you want to concentrate your time and your effort on a place that are hot right now, right? So example, if you try to do this here in San Yves, it's a little bit hard to get a good result with the same amount of time and same amount of effort that you're doing. So every uh, agent, they, they have the habit to farm. The first thing that they do before they farm and they look into what is going on in that area. You know, how is the market in the area? If the market is hot, then it's a good place to farm. If it's not, then we pass until it becomes hot again. Anthony, again, thank you for being here with us.
It's always appreciated, my friend. You're welcome. Not a problem. Guys, we're coming to an end. And uh, I thank you guys for being here with us. You got 20 people today. I'm very happy to see you guys here. And uh, we, we do prepare this meeting with uh, TLC, you know, very tender, loving, and care to give you some good information. We invite the, the title company, we invite lenders to help us build more knowledge because the knowledge is the most important thing. As everybody says, now uh, knowledge is power. So, and I really happy when I see all of you here today. Thank you again for being here with us in our meeting. I hope you have a great weekend and I'll see you again in our meeting next week. Thank you. Have a great day. Thanks, Arlinda. Was great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Arlindo. Thank you.